Ninja Gaiden 3 The Ancient Ship of Doom is by far the most challenging game in what may be the most brutally difficult trilogy for the NES. While our hero, Ryu Hayabusa, has some new tricks for the final part of the trilogy, he's definitely going to need them because the intensity has been cranked up to 11. If you're not careful, you could be swallowed up by swarms of enemies that will quickly deplete your life bar or send you flying into an instant death pit. So you may be surprised to learn that when the game was originally released in Japan, it was by far the easiest game in the series. The Japanese version, titled Ninja Ryu Kenden 3, is actually a lot of fun to play. If you feel like the Ninja Gaiden series is intimidating, you may want to give this version a try. Ninja Gaiden veterans can probably complete this one in a single sitting, but if you don't have the time, there are even passwords to save your progress. So what happened to the North American version that made it so difficult? Ninja Gaiden 3 was once again developed by Tecmo, and many of the original team members returned, including director Masato Kato, credited as Runmall in the game. Once again, the cutscenes are beautifully illustrated, and the story takes place between the events of the first and second games. Of the three, I'd say this game has the most interesting story, featuring several twists and the death of a major character. Ryu must have learned how to make copies of himself sometime after the events of this game, because sadly he does not have that ability in this one. He does get a new Ninpo magic, the Vacuum Wave Attack, and can also find an item that enhances his Dragon Sword. In the early 1990s, it wasn't totally uncommon to make a game more difficult for its North American release. Video game rentals were illegal in Japan, but were becoming a big business in the United States. Many developers were worried that rentals would hurt the sales of their games, so they would increase the difficulty to make it hard for players to finish the game during a 2-3 day rental window. Famously, games like Castlevania 3 or The Adventures of Bayou Billy were altered to thwart rentals, but in the case of Ninja Gaiden 3, it was not the only reason. While Ninja Ryu Kenden 3 has a totally reasonable difficulty level, Ninja Gaiden games had a reputation for being amongst the most challenging video games ever made, so there was some backlash from fans who were very disappointed that the third game in the series didn't try to top the previous ones. So for the North American version, enemies were changed or added, power-ups were altered, and just about everything deals twice as much damage. But they didn't stop there. The localization team also removed what feels like 90% of the game's checkpoints, which will force you to complete large chunks of the game on a single life. I think those changes would have been enough to bring this game's difficulty in line with the other entries in the series, and I agree that Ninja Gaiden games aren't supposed to be easy. However, I don't like the fact that they also took away the password system and then limited the amount of times that you can continue. None of the other Ninja Gaiden games limited your continues, and getting sent all the way back to the beginning is demoralizing. It makes you want to turn the game off instead of trying one more time. On the plus side, Ninja Gaiden 3 has truly impressive graphics featuring some of the most beautifully rendered backgrounds in the series. Some even have multiple scrolling layers. The controls are tight, and the level designs have a lot of vertical elements which add some nice variety to the gameplay. The soundtrack is upbeat and exciting, featuring music that nicely complements the fast-paced action. You shouldn't let the difficulty scare you away from this one, because everything else about it is great. The game was well received when it released in North America in August of 1991, only two months after its Japanese debut. Critics praised its layered backgrounds, and Nintendo Power Magazine gave it their coveted award for having the best challenge of 1991. Still, it didn't sell as well as the previous two games in the series, and was not released in Europe. So either players were put off by the insane difficulty, 
Or it was just that by 1991, the Sega Genesis had drawn away a lot of the type of players that would have appreciated a game like this. While the series eventually got a 3D reboot, Ninja Gaiden 3 marked the end of the original trilogy. Even if Tecmo wanted to continue the series, director Masato Kato left shortly after completing the game to work for Gainax, the anime studio famous for the Neon Genesis Evangelion series. Kato worked in the games division, where he was assistant director and script writer for a game based on Nadia, the secret of blue water, that was never released outside of Japan. In modern times, players and critics still appreciate Ninja Gaiden 3 for its well-polished graphics and legendary challenge. It doesn't appear on IGN's list of the top 100 NES games of all time, but I would argue that it's much better than many of the games that did make the list, and it would absolutely be in my personal top 100. For comparison, as of this recording on the crowdsourced rating site Ranker.com, Ninja Gaiden 3 is ranked at number 77 on their list of every NES game. Modern players that attempt this game will still have to deal with all of the challenges the NES is notorious for. Get ready for the fight of your life in this one. The enemies attack from every direction, spike traps rip massive chunks of health from your life bar, and many other traps are instant death. Five Continues would give you plenty of chances in most other NES games, but in Ninja Gaiden 3, it could only be minutes before it's game over. But what if I told you about secret tricks to get infinite lives? Or 99 Continues? What if I showed you simple techniques that can make some of the most difficult stages seem easy? And what if I showed you how to defeat every boss? Even the final demon himself? Well, on today's episode of You Can Beat Video Games, we'll learn all of that and more. If you're new to the channel, we're doing deep dives on retro video games and giving you the professional strategies that can be used by the casual gamer. Please make sure to subscribe and check out YouCanBeatVideoGames.com for episode lists, news, and official You Can Beat Video Games merchandise. Let's get started. All right, Ninja Gaiden 3. Before we get to the awesome opening cutscene, I want to tell you about this code to get 99 continues. So you can press start to skip the opening cutscene and bring up the title screen here. And you want to wait for the title screen to completely fade away. And then you're going to press the start button to make it reappear. You're going to do this until you've seen the title screen 8 times. So this is the 6th time right here. And when it gets to the 8th one... We're going to hold up, left, A, B, select, and then we'll press start. So here it is. Up, left, A, B, select, and press start. And when you die, you'll notice that you have 99 continues instead of the usual 5. So if you're having girl problems, I feel bad for you, son. I got 99 problems, but continues ain't one. And as the game opens up, it seems that Ryu is having some serious girl problems. It looked like Irene and Ryu were going to have a nice little thing after the end of the first Ninja Gaiden, but it looks like their relationship has hit a rocky spot here. I guess when the foundation of your relationship is being rescued from demons, that's not a great place to start. Certainly the first time that Irene met Ryu, she shot him at point blank range. So, yeah, that was probably not going to end well. Still, she seems genuinely scared here, and Irene is usually a very tough CIA agent that's packing heat. Maybe she remembered that Ryu is bulletproof, or maybe she just didn't realize how close she had gotten to the edge. So it looks like tonight, Irene will be sleeping with the fishes. 
Irene Liu was a very prominent character in the Ninja Gaiden series, so to see her killed at the very beginning of the game was pretty shocking. Also, the CIA report says that Ryu is the one that killed her, although we just saw exactly what happened. She fell off the edge of a cliff. Ryu didn't do it. We're being falsely accused here. As it turns out, not only was Irene's death an accident, but Ryu wasn't even the one that actually chased her to the edge of the cliff. I killed Irene, he says to himself. No, it was an imposter. And I guess almost anybody could put on a blue ninja outfit and seem to be Ryu Hayabusa. But you'd think that Irene, who had a more intimate relationship with the guy, would at least recognize the real Ryu's eyes. Still, the way that Irene was acting, it looked like she genuinely believed that the real Ryu was the one that was chasing her. So it seems that we have a mystery to solve. Let's get started. As we get started in Act 1, something that you'll notice right away is that you can freely climb on walls like in Ninja Gaiden 2, and we also now have the Windmill Throwing Star as our default weapon, which is awesome. It's a little bit pricey at 10 Ninpo magic points per shot, especially considering that weapons like these downward throwing dragon balls only cost 8, but when you only have 40 magic points at the beginning of the game, either cost is only going to get you 4 uses of the weapon, so it's essentially the same. Now, this invincible fire wheel, this costs 20 magic points to use, but it's well worth it. This weapon is very broken in Ninja Gaiden 3, and it's the one that we're going to lean on to get through some of the most difficult parts. Aside from its high cost, the other downside to the Invincible Fire is that if you pick up any other weapons while it's active, it will immediately cancel it, so you need to be careful not to pick up any weapons whenever you're using that Invincible Fire. I picked up the Art of the Fire Wheel weapon here because it's going to be good in these vertical areas as you're traveling upwards. An upward moving weapon is very nice, and it only costs 8 magic points to use instead of the 20 that the Invincible Fire Wheel costs. The Invincible Fire Wheel is a little bit pricey here at the beginning of the game, but as we gain more magic points as we move forward, it's going to get a lot better. The first boss is the Mantis Warrior. Oh no! Yeah, the Mantis Warrior is a joke. He'll attack you by spitting some fire that goes across the ground, which you can easily hide from by climbing up on the wall. But the better way to attack this guy is to wait for him to start spitting the fire, then jump over him and just wail on his back. You'll be able to finish him off very fast. As Act 1 wraps up, Ryu investigates the lab near where Irene was last seen. And just like in every other Ninja Gaiden game, somebody sneaks up behind him. For a ninja, I feel like this happens far too often to this guy. The mysterious stranger insists that Ryu goes to a place called the Castle Rock Fortress, and to get there, he's going to have to get past just so many traps. But hey, this is Ninja Gaiden. What did you expect? He says that Ryu is the only one that can make it, and that's probably true. There are very few humans alive that can survive the gauntlet ahead. We don't even know this guy's name, but he mentions Irene, so suddenly we're going to be rushing off to the desert. It's time for Act 2. Stage 2-1 is a short one and it begins with these sand traps. If you linger too long in the quicksand, you'll take 6 damage, although this is the only improvement made from the Japanese version. In the Japanese version, if you linger too long in the sand trap, you die. I don't know why with all the other changes that they made that dying in the sand was taking it too far, but hey, you know, we'll take it. Whenever you see these bouncy ball enemies, you need to stop and slowly move forward. If you don't move too far to the right, they won't start bouncing around like crazy and you'll be able to hit them. And if you see any enemies spawn to the left, kill those enemies first first and then return to take out the bouncy ball guys. So this guy comes from the left, so kill him first. Kill this drone over here to the left first, then take out the bouncy ball guy on the right. We'll take out this insect drone, 
Then we'll take out this ball enemy. And this time he got bouncing around, so if that happens, you'll need to try to hit him with your sword, or you can use your Art of the Fire Wheel magic. You can let that last enemy jump over you, and that brings us here to stage 2-2, and that is the last checkpoint in stage 2, so if you die at any point here, that's where you're going back to. That means that we need to be very cautious here. If you hit those spikes on the ceiling, you'll take serious damage, so be careful when you're jumping in this area. And you can be a little bit reckless with your magic before this point, because you'll be able to get a full refill right there. Skip these two orbs. You don't want to accidentally pick up a different weapon, and don't get hit by that spike ball at the very bottom because you're going too fast. Once you get in here, run to the right wall. Don't try to climb up the left side. Jump over onto the left side from the right platform, and use your Art of the Fire Wheel magic on the enemies that are above you. We'll be able to get a nice magic refill up here anyway, so don't worry about it if you use a little bit of magic. Climb up the left wall here. It's going to be much easier than climbing up the right. We'll be able to use our Art of the Fire Wheel here to clear that enemy, and then continue over to the right side. If you do fall into the lava, that's instant death, so make sure that you're always ahead of it, but sometimes the enemies take a moment to pop up whenever their platforms appear, so wait a few seconds before jumping up to the next platform, although you want to hurry over to that one on the right side. If you can at least make it to the one up each time, you won't lose any lives as you're working your way through the end of stage two. Over here, you don't want to get that windmill star, we want to stay with the art of the fire wheel, it's going to be very good on the boss. So just work your way up the middle on the right side, and you'll find the door. You don't want to fall into the lava here, so carefully jump across. There's going to be some fireballs that pop out. Navigate those, and once they've stopped popping out, make your way to the far door, and here's the boss, the Night Diver. This boss reminds me a lot of the first boss from the Batman game. And you'll see that he flies in a wavy pattern, and you want to attack him whenever he dips down low. Just never stand directly underneath the Night Diver, because he launches those fireballs straight downwards. Whenever he's up in the air, you'll also be able to catch him with your Heart of the Fire Wheel, so you shouldn't have too many problems fighting that guy. In the room that the Night Diver occupied, Ryu meets with an all-too-familiar face. Foster. I knew it smelled like stale Australian beer in here. Foster, of course, is the CIA agent from the first game that tried to manipulate Ryu into helping him obtain the demon statues so that he can have some kind of crazy ultimate power. This guy's no good, that's for sure. He also ordered Irene to terminate Ryu at the end of the first game, an order that she directly disobeyed. Hmm, is that why she was sent on a mission that ultimately ended in her demise? When questioned about Irene, Foster plays dumb, but it's clear that he knows more than he's saying right now. He says that we're bound to run into each other before long, and that's not just foreshadowing, that's totally going to happen. Yeah, I hope you're still alive when we run into you, Foster, because I definitely want to be the one that kills you. And that brings us to Act 3. So if I'm following this pirate map correctly, we need to go through the desert, up the volcano, and across the jungle, so that's where we're headed next. Watch down in the water for these fish enemies. Whenever you see them, you may want to take a quick step to the right so that they can jump out of the water and you can attack them. Be especially careful of them when you're on the moving platforms because they can easily knock you off into the water. We picked up the Vacuum Wave weapon here, and there's also a full magic refill in the middle, so make sure that you grab those things. The Vacuum Wave is nice, it hits above and below Ryu, but now that we have 50 magic points, the fact that it costs 10 means that we'll only be able to use it 5 times, while a weapon like this one, the Fire Dragon Balls, we can use 6. This is the trickiest part. You want to jump onto this platform when it's at a high point and then duck down so that that fish will jump over you. And when you get to the bottom, you can leap to the next platform and collect the one-up in midair. Make sure that you're collecting these one-ups because remember, if you die, we only have a limited number of continues in this game. So you want to have picked up those one-ups so we don't reduce our total number of lives. 
Stage 3 too represents a massive difficulty spike, so you need to be careful in here. You can drop straight through that platform on the left. Make sure to use your fire dragon balls to clear out those two enemies below before dropping down here, and then clear out this enemy on the right, jump over the projectile from the one on the left, and then clear it as well. You should be able to get both of those enemies as you run through here, and make sure that you use one of your magic weapons to take out those two jumping enemies in the bottom. Those guys can easily get out of control. Now we can be a bit reckless with our magic here because we're about to get a full refill, so rain fireballs on the enemies below, and then pick up the art to the fire wheel. That's going to be useful here, but do not move forward too quickly. You'll start spawning too many enemies. Just move very slowly across that platform and you'll be okay. Take out each enemy individually and then grab the invincible fire. We are certainly going to need it here. With the invincible fire, as long as we don't pick up another weapon, we are going to be in very good shape in this very difficult level, so I'll show you where you should activate it. Come through here, make sure to grab that power up to refill your magic points, and then activate your magic, but don't jump over to where the windmill star is. And then we're going to come straight across here to the left and drop down to pick up that scroll, which will permanently increase our magic to 60. Then we're just going to climb all the way up the left wall, jump across here to the door. There's some tiny platforms up ahead, and if you jump onto this one and quickly look left, you'll despawn a flying enemy that's coming from the left side. And make sure to jump to avoid those enemies, then drop down here and make sure to get that Art of the Fire Wheel out of the way, you don't want it. Come over here, activate your invincibility, get the sword, and then make your way up to the top. You can come across here, avoid those enemies. We want to save our invincibility so we have at least one usage of it for the boss, although there's two Ninpo refills up there at the top. Now once we get in here, you want to aggressively attack the boss that spawns on the right. That's the only one you can damage. Your invincibility will protect you from the windmill stars that it throws, so as soon as it starts throwing those, you can activate it. But don't touch the boss while you have the invincibility on or it will wear off. Now, if you don't have the invincibility, the Art of the Fire Wheel isn't bad, but whenever the boss starts throwing the stars, you want to jump up onto the platforms and move around the room in a clockwise formation. That will help you avoid them. Just be careful and keep moving when they're throwing the stars, and make sure to keep track of which boss you can damage, and you should be able to beat it without the invincibility. After defeating the boss, we come face to face with the imposter. Yeah, it's time to take this guy on. Let's see what he's got. In typical ninja fashion, they start running. Yeah, it's about time for a jump attack. As steel clashes with steel, we see that the imposter isn't all talk at all. Somehow he seems to have also acquired Ryu's ninja abilities, and he may be even stronger. This is not good. Luckily, it doesn't seem like he wants to kill Ryu, he just wants to roast him a little bit. Just like all stupid villains, while he's roasting Ryu, he slips up and he says something that he probably shouldn't have. He lets him know that the orders came from Foster. Ah uh, yes, of course Foster is behind this. Only he would make some kind of crazy program to copy Ryu. And yeah, he would certainly want to take out Irene. For as much as these bad guys seem to want Ryu to go to this Castle Rock Fortress, part of me thinks that we should just turn around and go home. Why should we give them the satisfaction? Irene's already dead. What do we have to prove at this point? Well, that's not what Ryu's going to do, of course. What in the world was that? Well, it was the imposter you, of course. And what's waiting for me at Castle Rock Fortress? That's what we're going to find out. It's time for Act 4. Just like in Act 2 and 3, Act 4 starts out with a shorter, easier stage followed by a more difficult second one. At the beginning here, you can grab this Art of the Fire Wheel, but then I recommend jumping onto the bottom of this platform and dropping off onto the next one. That's a little bit more accurate than jumping down to it. 
Then come across here, attack these enemies aggressively so that you can kill any shots that they fire at you, and make sure to take out any of the slow-moving drones that appear behind you. Before jumping across these platforms, make sure to take out the running enemies, and there's a few more drones that'll spawn here, and if you jump off the ledge and pull back to the left, you can spawn a third drone here, and that'll make it a little bit easier when you get onto the platform, you won't have to fight quite as many enemies. Just duck down here and take out the enemies as the platform moves to the left. There's a one up above the next platform, so make sure to grab it and then quickly jump off to the right, allowing that insect drone to fly harmlessly off the screen. Also grab the scroll to upgrade our magic to 70, and take out both of those insect drones with your downward dragon ball attack. The insect drones are kind of like the birds in this game. They are quite dangerous if you're not careful. In stage 4-2, this is a little bit longer one, and that's the last checkpoint of the act. Get all the way to the edge to grab that sword upgrade, and then head over here to the right, take out that eyeball enemy, and wait for the spikes to retract at the bottom before you drop down, then quickly run over to the right wall. If you get hit by those spikes, you're going to take 6 damage, and you only have 16 health to work with, so if you take 3 or more hits from the spikes in this game, you're dead. We have a lot of ground to cover here, so you don't want to take any damage from spikes, and make sure to come up here and grab the invincible fire, that's going to be very important moving forward. Be patient as you begin stage 4-2B and wait for the spikes to retract before climbing up the right wall and then jumping onto the small platforms to the left. Right before jumping up onto the chains, activate your invincibility fire and use it again when you get midway up the shaft. Just be sure to collect all of the magic refills. There's no additional weapons in that area, so you don't have to worry about canceling out your magic. You can also see that the magic will protect you from the spikes, which is nice, and you'll want to make sure to get that big magic refill at the bottom, but we do want to have the art of the fire wheel magic for the boss, so make sure to pick that up before you move through here. Get up on top of the chains at the very end, and you can jump over to the left wall and climb down. You do not want to get hit by the spikes right before the boss. Hurry to this position and start pelting the Sand Eater with your Art of the Fire Wheel magic, and when it starts to drop off the platform, head over to the left a few steps and then follow it behind as it walks to the right, attacking it all the way. It's possible to kill it in a single cycle, but if it digs into the ground, you want to jump up onto the left platform and then get to the middle, wait for it to pop out of the ground, and finish it off. After defeating the boss, once again this mysterious guy is able to sneak up on our hero. Come on, Ryu! You're a ninja! Pay attention! This time we find out his name. It's Clancy. This Clancy guy has been working on a plan called Biohazard with Foster, and none of that sounds good, but when he starts to explain it, we find out that it's even worse than it seems. They've created a monster called a Bionoid. Now I've seen the commercials for Domino's, these noids could eat all of the pizza in the world if we're not careful. It seems that there's an open seam between dimensions that was created when the demon we killed in the first game died, and inside it is an unlimited supply of life energy that Foster's been using to create the noids. Of course, there was more to Foster's plan in the first Ninja Gaiden than just trying to get some kind of statues and summon a demon. He probably knew all along that he would be able to open a dimensional rift and control some life energies. That Foster guy, what a jerk. If there was any question to how dangerous these noids are, Clancy confirms that it was a bio-noid that killed Irene. It seems that we won't be able to avoid the noid if Foster's in control of them. So the only thing we can do is make our way into the Castle Rock Fortress and stop him. Clancy doesn't have the power to do it, so it seems that Ryu is his only hope. As Act 5 begins, we're treated to an iconic Ninja Gaiden scene. Ryu rides a mountain peak to the right as the background scrolls to the left. I'm not sure if this is like an earthquake or something, or maybe he's on top of a small island that's floating in brown water. 
In any case, the ominous form of the Castle Rock Fortress appears in the background. This is where we have to go. Act 5 is the most difficult act yet. You want to hesitate before jumping across this first gap? Take out that enemy and then cross. There will be a couple more enemies on the other side, so take them out too and make sure to pick up the vacuum wave item. You want to stay on the bottom of these platforms though, that'll help you avoid the enemies, although you might as well launch your vacuum wave and take out the ones on this platform because there is a Ninpo refill right up there. Down here we can grab another Ninpo refill, but wait to take out this insect drone before moving forward or he might knock you into the pit. This room is very difficult if you don't know what to do. Climb up the left side and then wait to take out that slow moving drone and I would also take out the second one too. We have time for that. Jump up onto this platform as it's moving upward and quickly jump up to the next one. You may need to use some Ninpo magic to clear out these enemies once you get onto the last platform, but if you move quickly there, none of those purple mini jets will fly in and get you. If you do take a bit of damage, you'll have to climb back up, but there is a health refill when you get here to part 51C, and you want to just try to make those bouncy enemies move and get them to come down to the bottom where they'll harmlessly drop into the pit. Once both of them are out of the way, you can come up here where two more insect drones will attack, so that's why you need to take your time there. You do not want to fight all those enemies at once. Cling to the bottom of this platform and go all the way to the right to make all of the enemies spawn before you jump up on top of it and collect a few more Ninpo points. Take out the enemy on the right before entering the door, and that takes us to stage 5-2, and as usual, this is the only checkpoint in Act 5. Make sure to take out any enemies that spawn behind you, and duck to avoid these enemy walkers. They shoot a very devastating laser. Take out that floating enemy before moving forward, and you'll want to make sure to grab the full Ninpo refill and the sword power up at the bottom. Down here we'll be able to get an Art of the Fire Wheel power up, which will be very useful moving forward. Those Art of the Fire Wheels are going to be handy because this next section is a vertical climb. Climb up the right wall, then jump over to the left to avoid that eye. As you jump onto this small platform, take out the enemy, then drop down. You'll want to use your Art of the Fire Wheel fairly liberally down here. You need to take out these enemies as you move up, and you will be able to find some items to refill your magic points as we move forward. Make these enemies spawn, then hit them with your sword, and move forward into the door. In this area, the bridge breaks out below your feet so you can't linger in any one place, but you do want to make sure to pick up the 1-Up and the Invincible Fire Wheel. As soon as you get the invincibility, you can activate it, and that'll make the rest of that bridge part easy. Up here, you can activate your invincibility again. Head over here into the corner where you can get an item to refill a bit of your health and keep that invincibility hot. Over here you're going to slowly climb this wall, you don't need invincibility for this part. Head through here, you do not want to accidentally collect the vacuum wave, so don't turn on your invincibility through there, and make your way to the door at the top. At the beginning of part E, a bunch of enemies attack from the air, so turn on your invincibility one more time, but then grab this art of the fire wheel, we're going to find that very useful for the boss ahead. Carefully make your way down to the bottom, crouch to avoid the lasers, and take out any running enemies that come up from behind on the left. Continue to move through, drop down between these two enemies, and enter the door. We're going to see a short cutscene before we fight the boss. Instead of being stealthy, Ryu yells out, Come on out, Foster! You're finished! And somehow that actually works! When Foster appears, he tells Ryu his entire plan. Basically, the plan is that he wants to kill Ryu and make a bionoid out of his rotting corpse. So is that how the science works? You like do a murder on somebody and then you hit him with life energy and bionoids, science. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. And it seems that our friend the imposter is here, as well as a woman with a machine gun. Who are you? Oh, we know who that is. It's Irene. Of course the CIA wouldn't hang around to see if she was just holding her breath under the water. I guess they did think that she would die that easily. 
At this point, Irene mentions working with the army, which is probably how Robert gets involved for Ninja Gaiden 2. It's no use trying to escape, because it seems that the imposter Ryu is also a Super Saiyan. This is not good. Of course, Irene tries to shoot him with a gun. Yeah, Irene, that never works. The only way to kill demons is with ninja powers. The clone always starts on the right and he'll jump straight up two times as he throws some shurikens, so you want to jump with the boss and attack him, and when he launches those fireballs, go all the way into the corner and try to hit him with a few Art of the Fire wheels as he flips across the room. He'll just keep repeating this pattern, so as long as you just stay in the corner when he throws the fireballs and jump over those throwing stars, you should have no problem defeating this guy. Now that the imposter is gone, we have some unfinished business with Foster. Foster just says nothing. And it seems that Foster isn't the one that we should be worried about. This guy Clancy has been pulling the strings all along. We should probably know better than to trust mysterious figures that we meet in mad scientist labs. It's not like Clancy's plan is brilliant or anything. It's basically just Foster's plan. He just stole it. So now Clancy's the one that's in charge. Call it what you like. I'm not turning these ruins over to anyone. So yeah, how does it feel to be double-crossed, Foster? We all got used this time. Ryu, Irene, Foster. And of course, now the dimensional seam is opening and the life energy is pouring through. In typical Ninja Gaiden fashion, now that the Big Bad has revealed himself to us, he has places to be and he can't take the time to fight us right now. So of course, Clancy disappears into a portal, but as he fades away, Foster chases after him. And that's how Act 5 ends. It's time for Act 6. Act 6 starts out with another short cutscene. Irene and Ryu have been reunited, but it doesn't feel so good. Ryu wants to go after Clancy alone, and Irene insists on following. However, Ryu informs her that if she goes through the portal, she'll be torn to pieces. I don't know how he would even know that. For all we know, Foster was reassembled whenever he got to the other side of the portal. I think that Ryu just told Irene that she would die if she went through the portal because he didn't want her to follow him and start shooting at bulletproof demons with her gun. Instead, he tells her that she has to get out of her quickly. And she complies. Ryu promises that he'll come back alive. That's going to be a difficult promise to keep because the stages ahead are the most difficult ones yet. In almost all of the previous acts, the first stage has been the easy one and the second stage has been a lot harder, but that's not the case here in Act 6. Stage 6-1 is a good bit harder than Stage 6-2, and it's because these purple crystal platforms feel like they're covered in ice. Whenever you're sliding on these platforms, if you jump, whenever you land, you'll stop sliding, so I'm not sure how those physics work, but we are in a mysterious dimensional rift here, so I suppose they could work however they want to. So carefully make your way to the right, and you'll be attacked by some of these propeller head enemies. They're similar to the insect drones that we fought earlier, and also act like the bird enemies from the previous games, so be cautious of those. As you climb up the middle of this shaft, you'll be attacked on both sides by these purple mini-jet enemies, and if they ever get directly on your level, they'll come flying at you at incredible speeds. So you want to kind of jump up slowly and then drop back down so that you spawn the enemies, but then you're able to take them out. Whenever you get to the top, you can just hurry up there, but you need to take out most of the mini-jets on the way up, or they'll linger on the screen and start shooting at you. Up here at the top, take out this classic pumpkin head enemy, and I recommend using some magic to take out those small drones before jumping over that part in the middle which can totally damage you and making your way to the right. This is the last bit in stage 6-1, so if you need to use some magic to get past these propeller head enemies, use that magic. We don't have a lot more ground to cover. 
there's going to be a vacuum wave item here. You might want to pick that up because we'll be hanging from the bottom of some platforms in a short moment, and you can use that to take out the enemies above you. This ledge isn't slippery, but of course the purple ones are. Make sure to take out the enemies in front of you before you jump down, and once you get to this door, we've made it to stage 6-2. If you stand on the floor too long here, you'll drop through, and if you're at the bottom, you can die. You don't want to stand on that black divot either, because that will drop you down to a lower level. So avoid those areas and climb up the left wall. Clear this bubbling mass on the right, and then drop down to completely refill your Ninpo magic, then climb up the right wall. When you get up here, jump across, take out those enemies, use magic if you need it. We are going to get a full magic refill in the next area, so use your magic liberally. It's not a big deal. Take out those two pumpkin heads and head through the door. There's a trick in this area that will allow you to get infinite lives. So keep heading over here to the right, there's that full magic refill, and also a sword upgrade if you need it. When you jump over to this platform, use your vacuum wave or art of the fire wheel to collect the one up above you. Now here's the trick, if you head all the way back to the left, you'll go back to stage 6-2A, and when you head through the door back to 6-2B, all the items will have respawned, including the magic refill, and of course, the 1-Up. Now, you can only hold 9 extra lives at a time, but you can collect this 1-Up as many times as you want to, so if you want to fill up your lives to the full 9, I do recommend doing that. However, be cautious of the timer. If you run out of time, well, you'll have to start Stage 6-2 again. Of course, Stage 6-2 isn't really that difficult, so if you're low on lives, now could be a great time to stock up. Carefully make your way to the right, you don't want to fall into any of those instant death pits. And when you head into this door, we'll see a short cutscene before we face the boss. Hmm, who's this guy? It turns out that that creepy yellow face with the bright red eyes is Agent Foster. He's just been severely mutated once he got into the demon realm, and he kind of died, but he was brought back to life by the life energy. Well, now he's a horrifying abomination, and he's the next boss that we're going to have to fight. So get ready. It's time for the final showdown with Agent Foster. This one's been a long time coming. Go ahead and try. I won't be beaten by the likes of you. Hopefully you have the vacuum wave weapon for this boss, you want to climb up onto the left wall, wait for the boss to start charging, and whenever he gets past the middle of the room, you want to do a big jump that goes over the boss, and as soon as you land, launch your vacuum wave so that any of those falling enemies will be killed by it. Then you want to get in a few hits on the boss's back. That's his vulnerable spot. So you'll just keep repeating this process. Climb up the wall, Wait for him to charge, jump when he's about halfway past the middle of the room, use your vacuum wave, and just keep attacking his back, and sooner or later Foster will die. Now don't let yourself sink into the ground, especially after you defeated the boss. Just keep jumping as it fades out. You can totally lose a life that way. With Foster out of the way, there's only one bad guy left. Good old Clancy. Ooh, Clancy, you are not looking good, dude. You need to, like, breathe in some oxygen or something. Your face is super blue. Clancy has absorbed a ton of that life energy, and now he wants to show the world the power of these ruins. He asks, do you have any idea what these ruins really are? Are they the ancient ship of doom, perhaps? We're getting pretty close to the end of the game, and so far there have been no ancient ships, but there has been a lot of doom. And indeed, that is what they are. We're inside an interdimensional warship. Not to be confused with an alien warship, these are interdimensional beings. Totally different. It's also the new source of all life somehow. And, well, see for yourself. Act 7, the final act, opens with yet another cutscene. Irene looks out over onto the distance. 
as the ancient ship of doom rises up out of the ground. It looks pretty terrifying. In a strange attempt to intimidate us, Clancy activates the ancient warship's laser show? Yeah, it makes a big, beautiful energy ball that floats up over the horizon and flashes a whole bunch. Ryu even gives it two exclamation points. Yeah, that was cool, Clancy, but next time can you set it to some music like Dark Side of the Moon? As the world around him flashes, Ryu is once again caught in a trap door. Come on, Ryu, there's always a trap door. Well, we start out in stage 7-1, and this is one of the easier stages considering that this is the end of the game, but this is the last break that we're going to get. You'll notice as you jump across to the left that there is some resistance from the wind that'll kind of push you back to the right, so keep that in mind as you're making your jumps. You may need to try to jump a little bit farther than you think you have to. Up ahead, we're going to find the only invincibility power in all of Act 7, but I highly recommend that you grab it and you try to carry it as far as you can. I'm going to show you two strategies moving forward, one for if you still have the invincibility power up, and another one for if you don't. So if you die after you make it into stage 7-2 or 7-3, you'll want to use the second strategy, but see how far you can make it with the invincibility fire? It will save you a lot of hassle if you can do it. So with the invincibility fire route, we're going to go up the right side where you're going to find an item that completely refills your magic. So that'll be very helpful. Turn on that fire again at the top of the right wall and make your way into this room. There's a sword power up and another refill for our magic, but you don't want to collect that vacuum wave, so be very careful to make it spawn and then wait until it fades away. Climb down to this area where we'll use our invincibility again and make sure to take out that enemy and wait for your invincibility to wear off so that you don't pick up this windmill star. Picking up that windmill star will totally mess you up. Over here, the invincibility will actually protect you from the electricity, so we're going to wait until that platform is moving to the left at the bottom, then jump down to it, quickly jump up to this one, use your invincibility again to collect that one up in midair, and quickly make your way over to this area. If you're on the invincibility plan, you need to move quickly. You do not have a lot of time to work with, and you will not get any time back on the timer unless you die. That means we need to keep this timer for all of the final bosses. Still, if you could at least get through stage 7-2 with the invincibility, that would be great. And there's another magic refill right here, so it's as if the developers know that this strategy is a possibility. Don't activate your invincibility until you're past that vacuum wave item and come over here to collect a 10 Ninpo, use your invincibility again, drop down through the bottom to collect a 1-up, and then make your way over to the door, which will take you to 7-3. And you can see that our timer only has less than 110 seconds on it now, so we're getting down to the wire. Avoid that fire wheel power up and then head over here where you can collect a full magic refill and then climb up the left side of the wall. Use your invincibility to get through these enemies, it'll also protect you from the spikes, and head over into this room, where you want to take out a few of those flying enemies, then use your invincibility as you jump down onto this platform, which will disappear beneath your feet. There are no weapons that you need to worry about picking up in the rest of 7-3B, so once you get to this area, take out these enemies, jump over to this platform that will drop out from below your feet, and activate your invincibility so you don't get killed by those propeller head enemies that come towards you. If your invincibility wears off, make sure to activate it again quickly, but when you get to this room, wait for the spikes to retract before you climb up the right wall, then wait for them again to climb up the left side. You don't have a lot of time to mess around, but you want to be able to get to that magic refill and activate your magic before you collect it. That way it'll be as if your magic was free. 7-3D is the end. You want to hurry across to the right here, we don't have a lot of time to spare. 
Use your magic at the top there. A ton of enemies will rain down on you there, but you don't want to collect those fire dragon balls if you made it all this way with the invincibility. The invincibility is actually very good against the final boss. Grab that last ninpo and make your way into the final room. Now, if you died at any point along the way, here's how you do 7-2 and 7-3 without the invincibility. Make sure that you get the Art of the Fire Wheel here at the beginning of 7-2. It'll help you on this short climb to take out these enemies over on the right, but you'll want to switch over to the Dragon Balls because when you climb up to the top of the wall here on the right side, you're going to want to rain them down to the left to clear the enemies before you jump towards the door. You can liberally use your powers at the beginning here because there's a full magic refill. Before collecting it though, I like to come down here, take out these enemies to the left with the Dragon Balls, and then come back to refill my magic. You may want to consider getting the Vacuum Wave here. It will be very useful if you want to try an infinite life trick. But if you don't want to do that infinite life trick, I think that the Dragon Balls are a slightly better choice. Jump across this platform and take out that enemy, then take out these two slow-moving drones before waiting for that platform to pass the first electricity at the bottom and jump to it so that you land on it right as it passes the second one. Make sure you take out that insect drone as you're collecting the one up, and from here take out all of these enemies as you carefully walk over to the left. Now here's an infinite life trick. It's easier to do if you have the fire wheel or the vacuum wave, but it is possible to do it without them. But if you head back over into 7-2B whenever you get to 7-2C, you'll notice that that 1-up is respawned. You don't have a lot of time to mess around here, so if you want to try to stock up on lives, you are probably going to die at some point and have to start over stage 7-2 or at least 7-3. Over here, we're continuing to use our fire dragon balls so that we can take out these enemies. There's another full magic refill in this shaft, so make sure you pick that up as you climb, and that will take us here to 7-2D. Head across slowly at the beginning because all of those enemies just drop down on you, and there's a health item if you need it. Right now it doesn't look like we do, but there is a nice set of Ninpo refills up here, as well as a 1-up if you didn't take the time to stock up on 1-ups before. Remember, you can't hold more than 9 at any one time. You can see that because we didn't have the invincibility, we've been moving more slowly through these stages. And if you have lives to spare, as soon as you get to stage 7-3, you may just want to lose a life to reset the clock. Over here, you want to jump up this way and take out all three of these drones on the right side, and then climb the left wall, because you have to wait between these two spikes, and if you're waiting there, those drones will attack you, but if you've killed them already, well then you won't have to deal with them. Just get all the way to the top of the left wall, Kill the drones, wait for the spikes to retract, and jump through to the door. 7-3-B can be pretty tough without the invincibility, especially this part where the floor breaks out from under you. You do need to take a second to kill these enemies, but don't linger on there for too long. Once you get up here, collect that first Ninpo power-up, but I usually skip that one below. It's not really worth it to drop down there. Wait for that first enemy to despawn off the right side, and then come down here and collect this ninja scroll. If you get to the final bosses and defeat any one of them and then die, you'll go back to 7-3A, so you won't go all the way back to 7-1. But you'll actually be able to collect that ninja scroll again, and you can have more than 90 ninpo points. You can actually have up to 110 if you do it twice. Take out the enemies here and wait for the spikes to retract, then climb up the right wall. Wait in this position and take out the insect drones, then jump up here. You need to get all the way to the top of the wall on the left side and then jump over to the right or you probably won't get high enough to make it over there. And that brings us to 7-3-D, which we know is the final part of the game. So run through this part. Hesitate down here though, a bunch of enemies are going to fall. You want to take them out with your fire wheels. And you can use some dragon balls to take out that pumpkin head at the bottom, but it seems that he's despawned this time. Up here you want to grab the fire wheel power up. Other than the invincibility, it's the second best weapon against the final bosses. Of course, before we challenge the first of the final bosses, we have a cutscene to watch. Where is Clancy? Well, you're talking to him, Ryu. That's Clancy's new form. 
He's a big yellow monster guy now. Yeah. If you've been wondering this whole time what Clancy's motivation is, why he's been doing this whole thing, well, you're about to find out. It's because he is full on crazy. He wants to protect the earth from humans. Humans are weak and disgusting little creatures who love to fight. Who are you, Dracula? No, Clancy. I'm not going to agree with you that the human race needs to be exterminated. That's crazy talk, dude. He asks Ryu to join him, and then he makes a very compelling offer by saying that we could bring a perfect human with us, I assume, to repopulate the world with? Um, yeah, we're not going to do that. No reason can ever excuse the destruction and slaughter of mankind. It's about time we went all hunt for Red October on this warship. You're going down, Clancy. This first form of the boss may be the hardest boss in the entire game. Whenever you strike him, he's going to launch three lightning bolts. And what you want to do is try to get him over here on the left side, hit him a couple times from this platform, then run to the right and turn to the left after the second lightning bolt fires. That'll help you get back here in time to be able to strike him a few more times before he moves out of that position. Now, if you have the invincibility, you want to activate it right as soon as you start attacking this guy. Just stay in one spot and it'll protect you from the lightning. Now, you can't come in contact with the boss or it will deactivate your invincibility. If you have the invincibility, you're probably fighting against the timer, so you will need to use it right away and be very aggressive so that you can take out that boss as quickly as possible. We then see another cutscene, and it seems that this is Clancy's true form. Now if you have the invincibility, just stay here on the left side. There's a little space that opens up between the energy balls. You can just keep jumping straight up in the air and attacking Clancy in the face and then activate the invincibility once he gets the energy into his left hand. And if you just have the art of the fire wheel, you want to head to the right side first and then come back to the left whenever he makes the fireball in his hand. If you're running across the bottom, he won't hit you with that fireball. And if you're at the opposite side where he's pulling the energy from, it'll be pretty easy to avoid the one energy ball that comes over into your area and just keep up the pressure on the face. And that brings us to the final boss. This is it. The ancient security robot. Ryu! This boss has two phases. At first, you need to attack that cockpit on the front and jump over the wave shots that come out of that gun at the bottom. There's also a little laser that comes out of the middle, but it doesn't usually get too close to you and it doesn't deal a ton of damage. If you have any fire wheels left, use them on the cockpit, and then you just want to try to stay between the lasers here as you attack the weak point in the middle. Just kind of move with the boss, and that second phase really isn't that tough. Use whatever fire wheels you have left and he'll go down quickly. If you have any invincibility left, you want to use it here at the beginning when the cockpit is still alive. That's the harder part of this boss. You'll be able to aggressively take out the cockpit. Remember, you do not want to come in contact with the boss or it could deactivate your invincibility. And then you're just going to do the same thing. Stay in the middle of the two beams, keep attacking the weak point, and move with the boss. And it won't be long before this guy is scrap metal. And that's it. We've done it. We've beaten Ninja Gaiden 3. All we can do now is sit back, relax, and enjoy the cheesy ending. Just as he promised, Ryu emerges alive from the interdimensional portal, just in time to watch the ancient ship of doom explode over the horizon. That is not going to be good for the local environment. And of course, the Castle Rock Fortress can't continue to stand once the ancient robot has been destroyed. I mean, that's how castles work. If you kill that castle's demon, that thing instantly collapses. I don't completely understand the science behind it, but Ninja Gaiden has shown me time and again that that's exactly how castles work. And of course, 
Ryu and Irene are standing on a small rocky outcropping, observing the castle fall. This is the end of Clancy and Foster and their sinister plan. Irene never understands why people make and pursue evil plans until they wind up dead. And the fact is, Irene, they only wind up dead because we killed them. Of course, Ryu has some words of wisdom instead. All of creatures living on Earth in all worlds can never be just a part of someone's plans. If you say so, man. Sounds like some hippie stuff to me. He also says that fortunately mankind is never foolish enough to wipe itself out to achieve some ambition. And I really hope that he's right. Ryu tells Irene that he wants to thank all of the living beings in this world, but maybe he should just start with thanking her. If it wasn't for her intervention, he may have been killed by Foster's Bionoid. Well, it wouldn't be a Ninja Gaiden ending without a beautiful sunrise. A new day is about to begin. As the sun rises slowly in the background, Take a moment to soak it all in. The sun may be rising in this game, but in reality, this is where the sun sets on the Ninja Gaiden trilogy. Roll credits. After playing this game again, I still think that Ninja Gaiden 2 is my favorite game in the series, but this one is a close second. It has a lot of great stuff going for it, beautiful backgrounds, an awesome soundtrack, very exciting gameplay, and if you're turned off by the 5 continue thing, just use that 99 continues code. If it's your first time playing this game, I highly recommend using that code. I think it makes it a lot more fun. Now there is something to be said about the feeling you get when you're on your last life, on your last continue, and you know that it's for all the marbles. But for as intense and exciting as that is, I just don't think it's worth the frustrations. If you're playing with the 99 continues code, it doesn't take away the feeling you get when you perfectly nail a very difficult stage and beat a tough boss. You're still going to want to fist pump and high five someone after that, and that's what this game does best. If you've always felt like the Ninja Gaiden series wasn't for you because it's just too difficult, then definitely check out Ninja Ryu Kenden 3 for the Famicom. If you want to play it on a North American Nintendo, you can use a Famicom converter, which is something you can buy pretty cheaply on eBay. And the Famicom cartridge is a lot less expensive than the North American version. Well, I hope this video was able to help you finally beat Ninja Gaiden 3 and finally complete one of the most difficult trilogies on the NES. If it did, make sure to give it a like and make sure to subscribe for more videos because there will always be more evil government agents trying to drain the life energy from a demonic dimension, and that's why we'll be back again next week with another video game you can beat. Thanks for watching.